dropping stuff on me, so that's wonderful. That's what you love to see. Um, yeah, so we have grammar one and grammar two. So these are just like some sample questions that kind of show the different grammar topics that primarily show up on the test. And like I talked about last week, you know, we have grammar questions that generally focus on like verb and subject agreement. There are also grammar questions that tend to focus on pronouns and choosing the right kind of pronoun. And then we're also going to take a look a little bit through the Kahoot that we do today about some other kinds as well. Um, so that's more or less the plan here. Um, let me pull those up then and start sharing screen with you guys. I miss my fourth monitor. I'm over here with just three now. That's really sad. All right. Shows our screen right there looking good. All right, so Should be seeing that this was the first one here Let's see what we got. I got Sophia's answers Camilla's answers Muhammad's answers good stuff Okay All right, so just to start out with these, uh, you know, first questions, looks like, um, let's see, um, looks like everybody agreed on this first one that we're looking for A. This is like, I think, the most basic kind of question that you'll see on the test for the grammar stuff. And this is like, this should be really, really easy. Um, we're just looking to match the subject with the verb. This is a really easy example because the subject is right before the verb. There's nothing separating the verb from the subject. So this should be super, super simple. Species. That's a plural word, so I need to use the form that goes with they, right? We saw that in the example that we looked at last week. A would be the right answer here. Very straightforward. Um, same kind of deal with this. Now, we got pronouns, right? So when they're asking us about pronouns, then the basics with this is just we have to make sure that we understand who we are referring to and that we're not creating any sort of confusion or ambiguity, right? So... If I go back to, you know, this part here, right? We owe blank an immense debt of gratitude for having the wis vision of Porto. Okay, so the question is, we owe what, right? And, and if I pick words, you know, I have to be careful what I pick here because we have a lot of plural things. Now, I know that it's not going to be B because it's after the verb and this would come before a verb. So that's not going to work. Those ones also seems kind of odd, if you ask me. Um, because it's like ones meaning what it doesn't really clarify enough and then that would put us between them and those people now i think it's important here to take a look at this and analyze okay if i say them what would it be referring to right um if i go back usually i want to go back to the previous sentence to kind of get an idea about that and i might see that the previous sentence is talking about these same qualities now Reading on the rest of this sentence, I'm going to see that, you know, it's not exactly um, that part that I'm looking for. I, I think I might need to change my answer there besides them. Because if we look at what we see in the rest of the sentence, it says needed to create. And so qualities would not create something, right? It would probably be these people, the forefathers that it referred to before. And so I might want to be careful about using them. I might actually want to go with those people because... By specific, specifically saying people, I'm going to have it clear 100% that we're talking about the people, the forefathers, not these same qualities or liberties. So if I put them here, it could create some ambiguity because I've got this plural word, I've got this plural word, and what I really want is to refer back to this one, forefathers. Does that make sense? Let's throw some errors on that one. Yep. Okay, well. So just be careful that, like, if you're just going to use them, be th generally speaking in English, it's going to refer back to the previous plural noun. Now, if and, – and so we might have to go to the previous sentence. If it's really, really clear, like if it was the last word that was right here, like liberties – um, and, and it was still talking about the liberties, then it would be fine. But in this case, now that I see that I'm referring back to something that's like two sentences ago, I got to be careful. So 
in that case, it's better to choose an answer that eliminates that ambiguity and makes it really, really clear. So that's why I would recommend that you put those people. Um, okay, so going on to three. Yeah, Harold, I got your answer. Thank you. Let's take a look. This is a little tricky one that I just threw in here because I've seen this on every SAT and I find it really odd, but it's something that's good to know. Um, so we have firefighters are equipped with more powerful tools, blank the past, right? And so we've got than, just the simple comparison, right? Than those of, than that of, and then. D is definitely wrong. I think we're all aware of that. Um, now, the thing is this. When I use than, I am comparing two things. I have to make sure that I'm comparing the same things on both sides. So here we have powerful tools and we have the past. These are two different things. So there's something wrong here. If I just say than more powerful tools than the past, like it, it's not, it's missing something. I, and I think it's something that you might normally say out loud when you speak, like you might just say this, but it wouldn't actually be correct in writing. So the thing we're looking for here is to add another word that stands in for the powerful tools, right? And that would be those. So if I say more powerful tools than those of the past, than the tools of the past, now it works. And so B would be the right answer here for number three. If I just say than, I'm comparing tools to the past and it doesn't quite work. So that we need that extra something in there. So I, I feel like I see one of these questions on almost every SAT. So that's why I wanted to make sure to put it in here so you see this. Just keep that in mind. Anytime you have a comparison, make sure you have the same thing on both sides of the word than. If you don't, you're going to need this in the middle to sort of balance it. Any questions about that? Because I know that might be new for some people. I've seen that be an issue before. So the answer is B, right? Yeah, B would be your best answer. That is what it says, right? Yep, okay, just making sure. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, okay, possessives. So this is pretty straightforward here. Um, we're just gonna choose the right possessive adjective for the situation. So we're talking about John Gardner. Gardner's work continues to be widely read today for blank insight into the human condition. Okay, so, <coughs> sorry. We got a couple of different options here. Looks like I, I have two forms of it's. There's a difference between this one and this one. What's, what's the difference between these two? Can anyone explain that? <coughs> One is it is, and the other one is it's for him or her. Close, yeah. The first thing you said is absolutely right. It is, but then this would be more for an item, like something that belongs to a thing, right? So not necessarily a he or she. In that case, I would usually prefer his Either or her. A. Okay. So in this case, like if I'm looking at Gardner's work, that is the thing that I'm referring to here, then I would say work is an it. And so I would use it's without the apostrophe. That would be your best answer. So it should be D, yeah. Um, because we're talking about the insight of the work, right? So that's where that goes. Um, so be careful with that. This is adding another verb. It is saying it is, for it is insight. That wouldn't make sense if you just say it out loud, right? And, I, and his could be tempting because we're talking about John Gardner, but the sentence starts with Gardner's work. So that is the subject. That's what we should focus on. All right. And then the fifth one here, I, I wanted to throw in one about the apostrophe S because I know that that is also sometimes a challenge for people. Um, we can go over those rules really quick too if we want. But what do we got here? Let me see. So I got, a, I got C's from... Some people and D's from other people. Okay. So now um, the band is named Queen. I think we're all familiar with Queen, the band. 
So if you weren't and that confused you here, I apologize, but I tried to pick something that was pretty universally known. So, <laughs> um, Queen is the band. And so I don't necessarily, you know, do I need the apostrophe or not? And then the question is, where do I need it? Right? So I notice I have nouns right after this. So I'm going to need an apostrophe before these words. Like I can't have a bunch of nouns together without some kind of apostrophe action here. So one of these last two choices seems like it would be the right choice, right? Because these first two don't have an apostrophe on bandmates. And I need that because I can't just have bandmates, virtuosity and skills without an apostrophe. So then the question becomes, okay, which of these two is the right choice? So knowing that the band has multiple people in it, that means bandmates should be the word. And then I would add the apostrophe. And so that would be D. Yep. Making sure my thing is correct. I know what the answer. I'm just checking myself. Yeah. Queen bandmates. Um, and that's because, again, the, the word bandmates is plural. And then I add the apostrophe. So it, we're not just talking about one other person here. Um, I, and again, maybe that's something that you would have to assume from knowledge of the band queen. So if you weren't 100% sure on that, I could see where that could be a mistake. Maybe that's something I should fix in this for the future. I have a question. Yes. Um, is that the only case where you use an apostrophe after the S? Like when it's about number and possession? So I can I could show you a couple other cases if you want. Um, if, if you want some examples. Hang on, let me pull up my tablet and my thing. So yeah, let me get my pen out here. So the thing with the apostrophe S that I think is important to understand with this is that you have an original word and then you add this possessive idea to it. Okay. So uh, to give you an example, let me start sharing my one note here. Okay. So to just kind of like touch on this, if I have the word in singular and then the word in plural, right, I'm going to add the apostrophe S differently. So, um, like if I want to start with just a singular thing, right? Let's say say this, right? My sister's dog is gigantic. It is. It's an Akita. It's adorable, but it is massive and it's pretty scary. When that thing jumps on you, you, you kind of, you don't want to show fear, but you feel it. So um, now in this case, it's pretty clear. How many sisters do I have or how many sisters am I talking about? One, just one, right? Simple as that. Now, what if there was something that belonged to multiple sisters? What if I had like more than one sister, right? And I said this. this could be a totally valid example. Like I could say my sister's bedroom has one big closet for both of them. So what do we know now about my multiple sisters? That they're two and they own a, well, close. Closet. Yeah. There's two of them and they share a room. So because the room is technically for both of them, I'm saying my sisters, but then I'm putting the apostrophe here. So that's the, that's the rule, right? In this case, what I tell people to do, don't even think about the apostrophe, right? Don't even think about that first. Just think about the word, right? So is the word singular or plural? In this case, I'm thinking about one sister. In this case, I'm thinking about two. And so I'm gonna write the word sisters, right? But now that I have a plural word, if I put the apostrophe here, it changes the meaning and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to just put this after that, right? Right over here. 
And that's all you got to do. Make sense? Awesome. So yeah, that's the rule. Just before you think about the apostrophe, look at the word itself, analyze whether that word should be singular or plural, and that really is all you need to do to get it to work. Um, so yeah, that should be, I think, a simple enough explanation for that. Let's crack open those grammar questions set two, and then we'll uh, go ahead and check those. I've already got a couple people's answers for this, but if you want, if you haven't sent them yet, please do. Pull that up. Let's take a look. Okay, I got Camila's. I got Sophia's. I got Mo's. All right, cool. All right, so again, this is another one playing with pronouns, right? We have this, that, these, and those. Pretty straightforward. We're just looking for whether we should use singular or plural, and then whether we should use this or that. Now, something to look at here when you get a paragraph like this you may be able to look around and see if there's another example, right? And sure enough, just checking this sentence, you'll notice that it uses the word this type. And so that could be a clue right there for me. Um, generally, I want to use this if I just talked about it. And then I would use that if I was trying to separate from another one or compare to another one. So because this whole part is explaining car-centric design, I would say this type of design because I just talked about it, right? So I would want to choose D for this answer because, um, and also, again, if I use types, if I were to use one of these answers, then this word would have to be contribute singular, or sorry, without the S, like for a plural subject. So B and C don't work with the verb. Um, a and D do, but D is not only more consistent with the text, but it also makes more sense because we just got done describing this type of design. And so once I'm done describing it, I'm going to say right after that what the answer, or that I would refer to it as this type. Um, going on to the second one, let me see what you got here. All right, it looks like everybody agrees on D. Yeah, easy peasy. This is just forms of verbs. This this should be super easy to anybody doing this internationally because like y'all have learned English as a second language. And so this should seem super basic. But there are sometimes questions like this on the SAT. And the thing is, Americans sometimes mess this stuff up. So, yeah, D, C, simple as that. All right. Again, number three pretty uh, straightforward. I think we're just looking to choose the right tense in this case, whether we should go past or maybe future, like, and then maybe making sure it matches like it were is not correct unless it's a hypothetical. So I don't think that's the right answer. Looks like it was. And yeah, we have past simple tense here. He called. And so if he called it, then I would say it was simple as that. Okay, my thing is not broken. Good. Um, all right. Number four. Word order. And, and you'll notice some of these will have grammar mistakes if you see these. Um, there are, we're going to see some other questions like this that are a little bit similar where we're trying to sort of choose the right way to phrase a, se a sentence or a section of a sentence. Um, but, you know, what you want to look for is generally the shortest one that is also grammatically correct without changing any important meaning or anything. So this would be A because it's the only one that has the verb um, correct, right? In now, well, this one has the verb too, but this is, in now is, does not make sense. Um, 
So yeah, should be A for that one. I think everybody got that right too. And then this last one's a little bit tricky. I wanna see what you got. Looks like everybody said D for this, except Harold has got a C. All right, let's take a look. So if you're between C and D, that's good. That's, that's what we want. Um, there's a big difference here, actually. And again, we're looking to avoid ambiguity. If I put survival in this blank, ensuring survival for future generations, I could be talking about the survival of this language. I could be talking about the survival of future generations. Like the life of these people could depend on this. So I want to be careful with this because if I just say survival, I actually create ambiguity. I create a confusion. Survival of the language or survival of the generations. And I don't think that anyone's going to argue that using the language is a requirement for their survival. Like as human beings, I think that's a little extreme. I mean, I'm all for protecting indigenous languages. I did an entire MUN debate on that and, and won because of that. But um, I think we, we want to make sure we're focusing on, focusing on its survival, the survival of the language, not the people. So D does that. By adding that word its, it makes it crystal clear that we're focusing on the language and not the people. So that's the one we want. Any questions on any of these? No. All right. Lovely. Let's get those out of here then. So we are going to go ahead and do a little bit of Kahoot action because let's see here. Let me fire this up. All right, let me drop the link in the chat here for you. In case the link wasn't working, I just put that in the chat too for you. I always find the music just so groovy on Kahoot. I can't help it. Boop, 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 boop. Sir, can you please send it in the WhatsApp? Please? Yeah, sure. Thank you, thank you. One, two, three, four, five in here? Yeah. Am I in in the game? Because I can't yes. see others. I see, I see for us, I see one that says Moody. I see one that says Esteban. I see one that has the code 2212035. <laughs> I see Harold in here. I'm the one that has the code. <laughs> okay. It's all good. I don't have a problem with that. Um, we may waiting on anybody? Wait. Oh, no. We lost somebody. Wait, we lost something. Me, sorry. Oh, okay. I'm gonna come back. There we go. Hang on. There we go. Okay, cool. I see six people in here. Is that good now? Is everybody in? Wait, now there's seven. Oh my goodness. It's a, now there's a great mystery. That's all right. I won't complain. Maybe somebody's playing like remotely. I don't know. Or maybe someone's playing twice because they're just like so hardcore. Okay. Um, let me uh, get the screen share going for you. And then, yeah, let's get this going. All right. So there's a nice mix of questions in here. Okay. S all sorts of stuff. We got some vocabulary. We got some punctuation. We got some grammar. This is punctuation. You got two blank spaces. Mm -hmm. 
So where I put the brackets is like where you would have your your blanks, you know. I think that makes sense. Okay. All right. So the, uh, yeah, comma in both spaces is what we're looking for. Um, we're defining this abbreviation SEO or search engine optimization. So anytime we have like a, you know, defining thing that we're going to do separately there, we're going to make sure we put that between the commas so that it's clear that we're explaining what that acronym means. Um, so that's kind of the idea with this one, like, you know, you might normally start with the full name and then just put the abbreviation in parentheses or something. But in this case, they put the abbreviation first and then explained it. So you would need the commas before and after to actually do that properly. All right. So who got up there? If Devon. Okay. All right. Choose the right tense. We're choosing grammar based on the context. Use the context to help you. There we go. Okay, good. Yeah, you would want to use the passive voice here uh, being watched. And you want to use am because it's in continuous. Like this person is using present tense. I get the feeling. So I'm describing how I feel in that moment. I feel I am being watched, right? Um, so after being, I would use the, I, the ED form, right? So that would be the best way to do that. That would be a pretty complex one. Camila, you said... Understood, Camila. I, I believe you. It's all good. It happens. Sometimes the finger slips. One problem. My mental health. What would go in that bracket? Does anything go in that bracket? My, my hint would be that it's like my favorite punctuation of all the punctuations. I just happen to really like this one. Aha, uh -huh. colon would be the best. Yes, again, we, we want to quickly define something to like finish a sentence. Colon is perfect for that, right? I had one problem. What was the problem? My mental health, boom. Like it's, it's a perfect way to do that. Um, if I use a semicolon, I should have a complete sentence after it. I should have a sentence that could stand alone by itself. So I'm not gonna put a semicolon before a phrase that's just my mental health because that's an incomplete sentence. It doesn't have a verb, it doesn't have anything else. So I definitely want to stick to the colon here. Um, comma could kind of work, but it's not the best really. It's colon is the best choice here. All right, people moving around. Stay on, still keeping, keeping it on top. All right, least acceptable alternative. We're looking for an opposite of this. Or, or just one that's not a good synonym. Maybe not an opposite, but like not a good synonym. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the best choice here, Conquer. Like... A pioneer is someone who usually goes out and does something for the first time as sort of an innovator or often could be an explorer physically or and an explorer and adventurer, I think pretty similar. So I would say that the word conqueror is the best one to go with here because, um, yeah, pioneer doesn't necessarily go out to conquer stuff, but just to sort of do new things. All right. Stay on running the show. Blank system is one of the best in the world. Playing with those apostrophes. 
when I went to Japan, there it really is amazing. Their subway system is so good, guys. You don't know. It's it's something else. It's the future. There you go. Hey, love to see it. Love to see everybody get it right. Nice. Yeah, Japan singular, right? We're not gonna have, we're not gonna use the green one here, um, and we definitely need something. So blue doesn't work. And we're not trying to say subways system. It's it's a subway system. It's it's those two words go together. So that's perfectly fine. Nice job. You'll love to see it. All right. Stephen got that low ping. Got that fast internet. What's the best synonym for this one? Wonderful. It's wonderful. All right, fantastic. Yep, that's a good answer. That's your best synonym for wonderful. Just a really, really good thing. Okay, playing with pronouns a little bit and possessives. All right. Uh -huh. Okay, so again, we have the it's versus it is. This will show up on the test. I guarantee it. So make sure you check this out, right? I already have a verb in this sentence, comes. So it with the apostrophe is adding another verb. I cannot do that. It does. Remember that this apostrophe S has nothing to do with possessive because it's a, it's a different thing. It's it's the adjective, okay? So if you have it is... You would not say it is name comes. No, it's name comes. So just be careful with that. If you see that apostrophe S on the word it, test it. Separate it into two words and test it. Go, it is name. Now that sounds wrong. And that'll help you out. That's all you got to do. Just test that to make sure you know which one you're using correctly. All right. Ooh, that's moving up there. I like it. Deliver. What's the least acceptable? Hmm. Okay. Nice even spread here. I think deposit is the best one here for a couple of reasons. First of all, deposit can have more to do with like money. Um, and deliver typically it implies the idea of like taking something somewhere. Like there's some travel implied to it. And so like sending it, bringing it, or even turning it in, there's that act of like giving it to someone else to deliver something to someone else. Um, whereas deposits a little different in that concept, I think because it's more financial, it just doesn't quite fit the same way. Um, I wouldn't say that I like, you know, deposited a pizza at your house. I could send a pizza to your house. I could bring a pizza to your house. I could even turn in a pizza that I ordered for you. Like it's, that would be a little weird, but it's still better than saying I deposited a pizza. Like, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, another grammar one. What's the right tense? Hypothetical scenario. If you gave me a million dollars, I would be very happy indeed. And then I would have to pay a lot of taxes. All right, most acceptable to commoner. I think this is my hardest question on this one. Yeah. yeah, this is a hard one. Think about it. Aha. All right. Yeah. 
I don't think I've ever seen more than two people get one, this one right. Um, layman is a word that we use in English to refer to just like an average person, like just a normal dude. Um, a laywoman, layman, layperson, if you prefer. Uh, it, it's a very old English word, um, but it, it just means a commoner, like a normal common person, just kind of an average person in the society. Uh, expert would obviously be somebody a little more advanced. Uh, bourgeoisie is an older term for, you know, like the upper class, actually. Uh, so that wouldn't apply. Laborer, if you guess that, that's pretty close. But at the same time, like labor just implies that someone does work doesn't necessarily speak to sort of where they are in society and commoner and layman would be good synonyms. So yeah, if you haven't heard that word layman before, that's one of those words you might want to know for the SAT. And now, you know, Ooh, okay. Nice, nice, nice get. My friends are going to stay at beach house. This is another one of those things that like, Americans do wrong, but you guys should probably be okay with. Yeah, exactly. See, I love these questions. That I, I always call these gringo questions because of like how we are in Peru. But like, Americans mess this up all the time. Just read YouTube comments. You will see people doing there, 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 all incorrect. Um, I'm even guilty of messing it up from time to time, to be honest. So yeah, there. Possessive is the correct word, but because these three sound the same a lot of Americans make that mistake and that's why it's on the SAT So now, you know, this is this is close. You guys are only what I'm bad at math 25 points apart. That's <laughs> That's tight. I like it it's Getting sweaty. All right least acceptable alternative to mix. There's a word here that does not really mean mix Scatter is the correct one. Yeah. The other three really all could be like synonyms of mix, right? When we think about mixing something, we are putting things together. We could be blending a smoothie, mixing something in there in the blender. The blender is sometimes called the mixer, depending on who you talk to. Uh, scramble is also to mix stuff up. You think of scrambled eggs. Um, combine, very similar. Scatter, though, means we, we put things in different directions, right? Where they something scatters in many different directions. So that would actually be the least acceptable alternative. All right. Ooh, change up. I like it. All right. Most acceptable alternative to problem. We kind of saw one like this on a vocabulary exercise already. So you might already know this. You might you might just remember. What will it be? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. If you were stuck between those two, I get it. Um, I think the reason conundrum is better is that conundrum does imply something negative, and so does problem. Um, challenge does not necessarily have to be negative. There can be good challenges out there. People do like challenges sometimes. I think that because the concept of challenge can be interpreted differently, I think it's not the best choice. I think conundrum, though, is something where you could be like, okay, this is a conundrum. This is a problem that needs to be solved. This is not something good that I want to keep in my situation. Okay. Back, back, neck and neck. The blank is on strike. Apostrophe S or S apostrophe or just S what, or no, none. What, what's it going to be? Ah, 
Nice spread. Nice spread. Okay, so a union. Now, if, if you aren't familiar with these terms, that could be part of the problem here. So just to clarify, a union is what we call like a group of workers that have decided to negotiate as a group with their employer, right? So like the worker, there are multiple workers in the union. So I definitely think you would either pick the red one or the yellow one here. Now, the kind of proper way to do it though would be to write it with the apostrophe because the union belongs to the workers. It is their union. They are technically the owners of it. Each member is part of the union and they all are co-owners of the union so they all make the decisions together and so technically yeah you would call it a workers union with an apostrophe as you see in the red answer that would be your best one if you mark the yellow one i would probably let that slide to be fair but yeah you can't have a union with just one worker so the other two are out i have a question yeah go ahead tell me yeah so although i picked the red one but i'm a bit confused between the red one and the yellow one can okay. this work without apostrophe? So I think it could in some cases, like depending on how you want to interpret it, you could actually uh, look at it that way. You could say, okay, I'm treating this as like a compound noun, right? Workers union, all one thing. Um, so I, I don't think it, that's why I said, I don't think it's that bad of an answer. At the same time, like um, I've seen it written formally with the apostrophe as well. So I feel like in a more academic context, it is supposed to be written with the apostrophe because you are like, you know, there are workers that own the union, right? Um, so I, I think it's something where I, I can see it going both ways, but I think the formal proper way is to use the apostrophe, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one's a little tricky. I won't lie. Okay. This could be all of you saying this in a few years. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, um, had study would be best here. So. And I, and I think just because of the fact that if we think about studying and working, generally those are things that happen in a certain sequence, right? You go to university, you study, and or maybe in school you study, and then you go to work. And so we're thinking about what you had done in the past before your job situation now. So if I had studied harder when I was in college, I would have a better job now. I would, I, I would know more stuff and I would be in a better position, but I went to too many parties and I didn't do that so here we are um that's kind of how that should be interpreted if i say studied if i just go with the yellow option here the problem with that is that this is a hypothetical and in a hypothetical if i use the past tense i'm actually thinking about this moment so if i studied harder right now like if i was reading the books better now would that change my job right now i don't think it makes enough sense because like you would have to have studied in the past to get that improvement now. So I, I do think the red one is the best answer, if that makes sense. All right, I think there's only one or two left here. Man, yeah, just two more. Okay, another grammar one here. What do we got? What happened with the building? All right, was demolished would be the correct one. Um, the reason has been demolished does not work is that in English, we do not associate that grammar with a specific time. So if I use the present perfect tense, which is what that is, the has been or has whatever, I don't say the exact moment when that happened. And so in this example, I did say the moment I said last Saturday. And so that's why that's wrong. Uh, so I want to use past simple just was demolished that would be the correct form since i included that time 
Um, if I didn't uh, include that time, then yeah. Sir, I have a question. I don't sure. understand the sentence very well. Like it says the building was demolished last Saturday. I'll I'll miss it, but like I miss it. like oh that building I, like ah okay 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 you know, like, like I oh. will miss it. Okay, I thought it was yeah. like I will miss the building. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like you know, in the sense that like maybe you had some special sort of memories or nostalgia in this place. Maybe that wasn't totally clear. Um, but yeah, like I remember when they demolished like a football stadium I used to go to. That was sad. And when they demolished uh, the a concert venue that I used to go to, I was like, oh, they demolished that building. That's sad. I miss that place. Yeah, I I'm sorry for your loss. No, nah. <laughs> thank you. They the the concert place was a church that they turned into a concert place, and I went to so many good concerts there. And then they turned it back into a church, and then. It got demolished. <laughs> so when I read about that, I was like, oh, I used to go to that place all the time. I had so many good memories. All right. Last one. Nice. Okay. Yep. Have an eat. And, and this works because we have a period of time, right? Not a specific moment in the past, like we saw with the, uh, you know, has been demolished. In this case, I'm using present perfect with a period of time. And so that's totally okay. I can say I haven't eaten in over five hours. And, you know, maybe that's why I'm hungry. So five hours isn't that long to go without food, but I get hungry pretty fast. So, yeah, you can, there's, there's little pieces of my, own self in these questions. <laughs> Not gonna lie. <laughs> All right, let's see how it went. There was a lot of movement back and forth. It's hamburger statement. I like it. Yes, I'm up in the number two. And let's let's go. Where'd it go? Oh. All right, we got we got some good turnarounds. We got some back and forth in here. I like it. You love to see it. All right. Good deal. I first didn't get a good hold on the game. I started like at the fourth question. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's unfortunate. Sure. I need to make another one of these anyway to get uh, for some of the other stuff that we're going to do in the future. Some some questions obviously for the SAT don't translate well to a small format like this, but I I do have some ideas for you know some other ones that we could do in the future. So we'll probably whip up another one of those. Um, yeah. Any questions about anything we saw there before I move on? Are we good? I do have a question. Sure. Um, just like in general, I've been seeing like with these words and like, you know, corporations, businesses, that maybe it would be helpful to like have a list or is there like any list about like famous businesses, corporations, organizations in America to, you know, keep in mind to not make mistakes? Like, um, the workers union or stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. That's um, yeah. That union thing was kind of more of a specific term that I guess would be like relevant to that specific context. I, I don't feel like you're going to see like you're not going to be tested on your knowledge of like how to write things with corporations or anything like they're not going to show you McDonald's and force you to do that because actually they try really hard not to include any brands or anything like that. Um, so that's generally not an issue. Um, let me also just pull this up too. like this link, I think is really good to use. Um, and I've, I put this in our slides before, but I'll just also copy this over and send it to everybody here too. This is a really good list to study. Um, I've, I've looked through some SAT lists before and like some schools have their list published and this is like a good international American school. That's like. You know, seems like it's a decent place. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of some of the words that you should be expected to know. So in general, you're not going to be asked about too many like of those kinds of terms. I don't think I think most of the time when they're testing you on words, they're testing you more on the, you know, nouns, adjectives and verbs for vocabulary. 
when we're looking at the apostrophe situations, like they're typically looking to see if you can identify, okay, where should the apostrophe go? And in my experience with the SAT questions, the answer usually does have an apostrophe. Like it's, it's not that the, the correct answer is almost never no apostrophe. Like there's always a apostrophe. It's just a question of like, can you figure out where to put it? And so if I saw that workers union question, I would probably lean towards putting it on the S like after the S because it's like, okay, I kind of see what they're doing here. They're asking me to put the apostrophe somewhere. They want me to put one somewhere, you know, that's kind of what they're doing with those, those questions. But, um, but that list that I just sent that link to, uh, I would definitely recommend you go there for a little bit more practice if you want to go review some words or just, you know, brush up on that stuff. All right. So anything else? All right. If not, then we're going to touch on another kind of question. And then I'm going to leave you with a little bit of practice with that. And then we'll take a little break before we get into the last part for today um so is it preferable to memorize all these words i wouldn't say necessarily memorize i would say um practice some of them. like go through and see if there are some words that you know pick the ones you don't know first okay if you if you have a list of words start with the ones that you do know and just go through and start crossing those off if you're like okay i'm confident that i will remember what this means let me get this out of my face um then when you get to words that you don't know, I would suggest then, yes, take a look at the definitions, maybe see if you can see an example of those. Um, you might want to practice even making your own sentences with those. Um, try to connect words to the roots of the words. If you're familiar with the roots of words, you can often sort of interpret what a word means instead of memorizing it. And I want to give a shout out to Malik, who uh, actually told me this. We were talking on WhatsApp today. Um, he, he follows the channel and he was asking me about this stuff and he said he had been studying his root words more than studying the words themselves. And he found that was a good strategy. And I think it makes sense in some ways. Like um, I can actually show you what he showed me. Um, hang on. Where? Here we go. There's a PDF. Yeah, let me, uh, let me share this with you so you can see this. And I can actually throw this out to the group if you want. Um, this was what he's been studying a little bit, like this idea of focusing on the root words or the parts of, of words, because it makes sense. They have meaning. Like if I see agri, right, I know that's agriculture that's related to farming. And so anything that comes up related to that, if I see that agri in the word, I can kind of assume confidently that like, OK, it's got to have something to do with farming because I see this. You know, if I see agribusiness or something, I would be like, okay, it's a business that has to do with agriculture. So instead of me trying to memorize every single word, I might want to focus on some of these different roots and get an idea of what they might mean. Um, having said that, there's this is a long list too. So I wouldn't say that necessarily you want to memorize every single one of these, but get familiar with some of them that you might want to, you know, learn because it might save you some time. Um, like, I think it's kind of, um, you know, the fact that Cardi right? Refers to the heart, cardiac, cardiologist. You might be familiar with these already without even realizing it, but then that can save you some time instead of having to memorize multiple words that have similar roots. Like, um, I think the, some of the suffixes in here are also really, really helpful. Um, I think the, like grass was one that I was looking at before. Yeah. Like these ones, grad or grass. Like you think about words that imply progression, progress, right? Um, so it involves going forward or, or movement, right? Graduate, you go from one level to the next. You know, I digress. I'm going off of a topic. Gradual, steady, you know, progression. So when you start understanding a little more of what these mean, then that can kind of help you to sort of guess what words mean instead of having to memorize a bunch of words. And I think this could be a good strategy for people. So I'll share that with you. And uh, thanks to Malik for bringing that up to me because I thought that was a smart idea. Um, but I also, like I would say, um, I think, I mean, vocabulary is important. It is 30% of the grade on English. I would still give more of my attention towards the 
connecting words because the connecting words are going to be about half of those questions and that's a much smaller set of words so if you can dominate your connectors you're going to have half of your vocabulary figured out and with a lot less effort because there's only like 15 connecting words that you need to know um like the ones that we practiced in the last class so if you get good at those you're kind of set and then with vocabulary do a little bit every day you know if you do just a few words a day by the time you take the test you're gonna have a lot of them in your head that's what i would do anyway yeah thanks you're welcome all right so let's talk a little bit about this um i want to talk about another kind of question and we're going to do a little bit of practice with this um i think this is another easy category of questions on the sat but i think it's good to just go over it make sure we understand what to do um sentence completion questions okay so these are like fill in the blanks but they're just bigger they're, they're asking you to finish the text generally speaking and this is the way the question is phrased it says which choice most logically completes the text so that's what we're looking for anytime i see this completes i know okay i'm trying to complete a sentence and here's an example from the practice test from the sat so you can tell you what this looks like right so generally the blank is going to be at the end of the paragraph most of the examples that i have seen that's what's going on the uh the blank is at the end i have seen a couple in the middle but most of them are at the end so what I'm looking for is just a good logical conclusion to the paragraph when I see it at the end. So I want to apply my method as always. Remember what we've, I want to emphasize this every single week. Start with the question, look at what kind of question it is, right? That's your first two steps. Go, okay, question, completion. Okay, I know that I need to look around here, especially, okay? So I, now in this case, I might want to, you know, I'm going to focus on this blank here. Consequently, they give me a transition word. So I want to think about, okay, what would be the direct consequence of this previous thing, right? So introducing engineered DNA into plant species to inhibit their reproduction may offer a path towards exclusively targeting E. Isula. Consequently, so I'm trying to inhibit their reproduction, to target this specific thing. That's what I'm looking for. And looking at this, right? That's the key kind of key idea. Um, which of the answers kind of follows that logically? That's really all the question is here. Go ahead and tell me what you think. Could it be D? You think D? Any other opinions? It's a good answer. Um, yeah. I mean, really, it, these are pretty straightforward. Now, I, I mark this as an easy example. I think that this is a very straightforward example because I've got in that pre like because of the consequently i know i just need to read this sentence like i just need a logical conclusion to this sentence it's not even completes the text it just completes this sentence and so since that sentence is talking about inhibit reproduction there's only one answer here that really talks about that or or not even directly but like close enough right d says reducing their numbers okay that would be connected to reproduction uh, B and C talk about other things, so I would never mark those like ecological benefits and enabling cattle. That has nothing to do with these. This E Asula, um, the A one starts out okay, but then it's like talking about herbicides, and it's like, well, that's not what reproduction is about. Like herbicide just kills the thing, so that wouldn't have anything to do with inhibiting their reproduction. So D is really the only answer that kind of makes sense here. Um, so that's what I would answer. I think that's a good answer. Um, let's take a look at a harder example where we have more text to process here. Notice the difference with the way that this blank is set up. So again, I still look at my question. I see most logically completes, and then I want to look at that blank and notice that here it says these findings suggest that. So now I'm not just trying to complete the last sentence. I'm trying to kind of sum up this whole paragraph because I need to know what the findings are, right? These findings. So I, I'm going to look for that 
right? I see these findings suggest, and I realize I see the word found up here. So I'm going to go ahead and like kind of expand my reading up until this part. So ornithologist Allison J. Schultz and others have found that males in several species of the tanager genus round plus that was use microstructures in their feathers to manipulate light, creating the appearance of deeper saturation without the birds necessarily having to maintain a carotenoid rich diet. Okay. So that's the findings. They have found that, right? So now I'm looking for a good logical conclusion to this, this finding, right? Or what it suggests, what would be the next logical step here? Take your time and really analyze this one because I think it's a little trickier and you have to process some more information than we did in the last one. Now, I will say in this particular question, you may benefit from reading more, but I can tell you that you can still answer the question by just reading what I have in the box. Again, we don't want to read more than we have to, but you may, you may get more information by reading the previous sentence as well. So if, if you've expanded to this point and you're still not really getting it, maybe read one more sentence before to see if that can help you. Is it in B? You think, okay, B. I've gotten texted an A. You're telling me it could be B? I think it's D. All right, and I'm hearing a D too. Ooh, we're all over the place. I think yeah. it's C. All right, yes. Everybody, we've, we've marked off for it. I love it. All right. Yeah, fun times. I love it when that happens, honestly. Okay, so let's take a look at these for a second. So... I want to st I'll, I'll go through and let's do a little process of elimination. Um, and, and for me, the key information is here. Okay. It says that, you know, several species use microstructures in their feathers to manipulate light, creating the appearance of deeper saturation without the birds necessarily having this diet. Now, I don't, without reading the rest, I'm just looking at this and saying, okay, what you're telling me is that some birds eat a diet with this carotenoid stuff. I have no idea what that is, and I don't really care. I don't need to know what that word means. Um, they have a magic substance. They, have, they eat their broccoli, whatever it is. Um, so when they eat this stuff, it would give them this deeper saturation or this color, right? But some of them are using microstructures in the feathers. Some of them are like sort of producing that same appearance without the diet. So that gives me the idea that there's something kind of like deceptive about this because it starts with this. However, we have the appearance without necessarily having the diet. So immediately it draws my brain to fitness. And I think, okay, what if, if I saw somebody who was like, in really good shape, but they don't have a good diet and they don't work. Maybe they're, maybe they're injecting a little bit of something, something, right? Maybe they're cheating. I don't know. But just looking at these options, then individual male tanagers can engage in honest signaling without carotenoid consumption. Is it honest if it's just the appearance of something? I think that's the big question. Not really. Not really, right? If it's just the appearance, but you're not actually eating the diet that gives you the good stuff, then it's not really an honest signal. Like, and this is where if I read back, I, I could see that um, there is some more information about that in the previous sentence. Like it talks about saturated colors serve to communicate an honest signal. So... I could have read the previous part and understood that better, 
But again, just seeing that phrase appearance of without the diet is like telling me that it's not honest. And so that makes me lean away from A. I'm thinking no, right? And then I'm looking at like feather microstructures be less effective for signaling fitness. I don't think that makes sense because the feather microstructures produce the saturated color. Like they, you can't tell the difference. Um, C, scientists have yet to determine why they have a preference. That's irrelevant here, actually. Like, I mean, they, they understand that that is a tendency. They're not investigating why. They're investigating how they get that color. That's what they're looking for. So they started out by talking about the birds' diets and that that's usually where it comes from. So I don't think they were looking at why there's a preference for the colors. It's just that they have colors and sometimes they produce them in different ways. So the last option I think is the best. Um, so I'm, I'm agreeing with Mohammed on this one. A male tanager's appearance may function as a dishonest signal because he's faking it. He's not eating the good food but he is colorful still. So he has this trick with the microstructures in the feathers to look better without doing the work. And so, again, just from this area in the blue that I highlighted here, you could come to that conclusion without reading more. Um, reading the previous sentence would help. I will agree. Like, it, it would give you more information that you could use. So, again, we want to try to answer questions without reading more than we need to. I'm going to read just this part down here first. If I was stuck or maybe I was between a couple of options, I might go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to read one more sentence, you know, and see if that helps. Because if I read the previous sentence and I saw, oh, uh, you know, carotenoids confer health benefits, they communicate an honest signal, then I would understand, oh, okay, eating this stuff is the honest signal. So A is definitely wrong because it's not an honest signal if they're not eating that. And that would probably help me find D very quickly because D is kind of the opposite of A. And so if I know that A is really wrong, I might see D and go, ooh, that has to be right. So um, that's, that's what you want to do when you approach these. Now, again, notice the difference, just real quick to compare. Notice the difference between these two questions, right? In this question, and the reason I call this an easy question is because we have this word consequently right? They give us this. And so we're only completing a sentence, right? Just this sentence. I do not need anything from before. Again, some of the information from before could help me, but you really don't need it. Now we see the difference when we get into, you know, the next one where I have these findings suggest. And so I don't have the first half of the sentence, really. I don't have a logical connector. I don't have a clear path. I have to go back more and read more. You know, so I, I definitely, when I see these findings, now I have to go and look for the word found. And I realize I need to look at all this at least. So there is more information to process. And this is what you might see if you get a hard module. If you do the first part of the test really well, they're going to give you harder questions on the second part of the test. And so you might get that first example on the first part of the test and you might crush it. And then on the second part of the test, they start giving you these ones. They're going to give you more difficult ones. So they, they have like easy and hard versions of different kinds of questions. Uh, so this is one of those cases where you're probably going to see this if you're doing well on the first part. You're, you'll go to the second module and it'll download harder questions for you. Uh, so that's what you might notice. There's, there's a different degree of difficulty when we do sentence completion questions. We're going to see that as well with our practice. Any questions about these right now? All right, so what we're going to do, I'm going to send over some files and we'll take a little break and get those set up and we'll just take a few minutes to recharge here. So I think I'll send you the easy one and then, well, this one's, this one's pretty, the first one's pretty easy. I'll send you the easy one and the harder one and then we'll do this. We'll do the first one together and then we'll do the second one independently. So I'll send these over right now. Okay. All right. So let's take a little break. We'll take uh, 10 minutes, 645 right now on my, my clock. Uh, so in 10 minutes, we'll come back and we'll do those together. Okay.
feeling good. Get to stretch out a little bit. Stay hydrated. I don't know how the weather's like where you all are at, but it's been hot here. We all good to go. If you want to just throw a thumbs up or something, just so I know that we're back, we'll uh, get, get going here. I just, I guess I am one minute early. All right, cool. Looks like just about everybody's here. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and hop into that set one first. We'll we'll look at these together a little bit, and then we'll uh, check out. I'll let you do the other ones. So, this first set is intentionally meant to be kind of more easy questions just to get more familiar with you know this type of exercise that you're going to see on the exam um we have five questions in here the last one's a little bit more like a medium difficulty a little more similar to that last one i showed you in the examples and then the next set has harder ones so that's what we're going to try to do here is step up our game a little bit so just looking at the ish all right so the first one here, we have something in the middle of the text. Uh, we have, you know, this here. So I'm probably going to want to read, again, just what I want to read is like this stuff before in most cases, right? Um, that's, and maybe just a little bit after. Like at most, I'm going to read through here. Okay, this, this would be the maximum amount that I want to look at. Um, so I might start by just going through this real quick. Since it's not that long, I can read through this and sort of get a good idea, right? So about nuclear fusion technology could revolutionize energy now it's explaining how it works okay combines elements cool tremendous amounts of energy and then this is this is similar to how stars generate their immense power okay so now um let's take a look here at what i've got so one day this powerful technology could be used to power entire cities and towns again this this next sentence that comes after this is similar to how stars generate their immense power and this explanation i need something that kind of fits in between those two things um so i think implications and powering entire cities doesn't quite work here i don't feel like that's the right answer because that's getting into more like the consequences of it and we're not done sort of explaining it so i need to stay with explanation um process has the potential to provide a virtually inexhaustible source of energy that that seems like that could work harnessing nuclear again this is also consequences so again when we're looking at these question uh, options try to look at which one is different and here i see that there are three that are focusing on like the consequences new era of clean renewable energy power entire cities implications like three of these are focusing on future things that could happen one of them is focusing a little bit on that, but it's it's still, you know, sticking to this concept of like what it is, right? A virtually inexhaustible source of energy, similar to how stars generate the power. Like that all makes sense to me, right? Like the sun's not going to burn out for millions and millions and millions of years. So we're good for a long time, pretty much virtually inexhaustible. Like that fits. So I'm probably going to say C. I got it right. Good stuff. It's pretty easy when you make it. Um, so... Again, this is just all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to read just this part here, right? Kind of figure out what fits. What are we talking about? We're describing how it works, comparing it to stars. Three of these are really looking more towards the impact. One of them is, you know, it touches on it with by saying the potential, but it's still focusing on like the significance of it, right? The, the why we're talking about it, which I think is the right answer. Okay. Now, that one you'll notice was just a blank in the middle of the paragraph. So we were just inserting a sentence. Now we're completing this sentence here. So again, I'm going to focus on this, right? And so I, I'm probably going to need to read a little bit more than this. Um, I might want to, again, I, only, I usually like to look at the sentence right after it and see if I can just figure it out with just this stuff. Uh, since I'm finishing this sentence, I'm going to focus on it and it has a connector. Although scientists have made important progress in understanding the causes of this devastating condition, comma, I know that then I need to contrast something. I need something that goes in a different direction. Um, this devastating condition, I'm not sure what it is. I'm just going to take a quick peek up here and I see it says Alzheimer's disease. So I know that that's what I'm talking about here. It says further research is needed before any new treatment can be approved. So I get the sense from this last sentence that this is like, 
undecided and we have made progress, but something is still unclear. And so that's what I'm looking for here. It's still unclear which approach will be. More. I just said the word unclear and I didn't mean to do that. That that makes me think this is probably the right answer. Um, still no known cure. Yeah, that's probably true, but I don't think that's what we're talking about because we're talking about new treatments. Um, none have proven successful. That doesn't match with this either because it would seem like you wouldn't do further research if none of them have been good, which include genetic factor. Yeah, no, that doesn't make sense either because we're talking about new treatments. So yeah, I think when I said unclear, that, that just magically did it. I would say A. Okay, pretty straightforward. So I just wanted to model a couple of those for you, show you how I approach them. Um, take a look at the third one and go ahead and send me your answers in the chat to me privately, please. All right. See if you can figure out number three. All right, looks like I'm getting some answers. Looks like we're all agreeing here. I like the speed. The faster we finish these, the faster we have, or the more time we have for review, the more we can spend time on tricky ones. So that's always important. We want to try to work fast. Quickly, but accurately. So again, all I really want to read is just the part up through here, pretty much. This is all I really need for most of these cases. Um, and I stopped here just because I see a semicolon. So I know there's like another sentence attached to this, which might be useful, but like I want to focus more on the part that's just right here. This is all I really need to read in this case. And there's a key phrase in the sentence that comes after, which gives me the answer. So I'm curious to hear from some of the ones who've answered already. Camila? Why did you choose B? Um, because it says loss of this particular species. Uh huh. Yup. Good. Okay. So because I see these particular species, that's my clue that I need to insert some particular species here. And sure enough, B says river dolphins, jaguars, and tapirs, and that's the only one that does that. So that would be the best answer. Very good. So that's why, again, I usually want to read the next sentence and whatever comes before just to kind of get my context and make sure I'm not missing something important. Because if I didn't read that next sentence, I would miss these particular species. I wouldn't realize that that's referring back to what I'm inserting in this blank. All right. Go ahead and give me uh, your answers for four. Interesting. All right, so let's see, I got one, two, three, four answers now, yeah. All right, let's see what we got. Okay, so in this particular case, I don't feel like there's a lot of connections in the rest of the paragraph to the ideas in these answers. So I need to try to kind of like 
focus on the words and see if I can sort of match up some of the words. And again, I want to do this where I just sort of read, you know, this. Okay. I mean, I'm going to read a little bit of before this because unfortunately is not enough context. So I'm just going to read this and, you know, I say, okay, the Islamic golden age is incredibly important period of history, great flourishing arts, science and culture. Unfortunately, this, and then this loss is not just about nostalgia. There's something about this loss that I might want to focus on here. So now there's nothing in here that talks about being widely recognized. I don't really see any other information about this stuff, about foreign empires and internal conflicts. I don't really see, again, other empires. It didn't talk about other empires and it didn't talk about religious differences really anywhere else or, or kind of like, I mean, this is an explanation that could be true, but I didn't get much more confirmation of that. So we have a problem here where like when it comes to all of these, uh, all of these like answers, there's no additional context in the paragraph to sort of validate those specific points. Like I don't have, it didn't tell me which empires it didn't tell me like what religious differences or other religions that were involved. It didn't tell me like about the perspective today. Although this one is a little bit contradicted by this statement. So I now what I want to do in this case is focus on the phrasing, right? And what I notice is that the very next sentence says, this loss and one of these answers mentions the word loss and that that kind of gives me a clue that maybe i should stick with that answer and keep it simple um has since been lost to time does match up with this idea of this loss you know so I think that would be my best choice since I don't have, like if I saw another piece of the paragraph talking about one of these ideas, you know, people prefer talking about the Roman empire or, you know, today's historians uh, focus on the accomplishments of Europeans or whatever. Like if I saw something like that, then I could back up one of these other answers. But in the absence of that, I'm going to focus just on the words and actually keep it really simple. So B would be your best answer here. Because it does explain it, but it also has this connection to the next sentence. And since it says this loss, I'm going to try to connect it back to that. So while I, I think that there might be truth to D, it doesn't quite have enough of a connection, you know, to, to the next sentence. And that's why I think B is the best answer. All right, go ahead and try number five and tell me what you think about this one. This one's a little more similar to that hard case. I think this would be like a medium hard. Got a couple of options already. Let's keep it coming. I'll give you a minute. got some we got some variety here i got some maybes between two options i got a b i got a c i got another b i got another c all right let's take a look at these so again i'm i'm looking at this first i see these advancements and i go okay i gotta figure out what the advances are oh it looks like looks like the previous sentence was nice enough to tell me what the advances are 
So significantly higher efficiencies. And, and I, I also like to sometimes just take a quick look at the very first thing in the paragraph because that'll tell me what it's all about. And so I see that this idea of efficiency is really important here for this paragraph. Like it's focusing on how efficient the solar panels are. And without even reading the rest of this, I kind of know that it's going to be talking about that. So again, just focusing on what I need to read. So thinking about that, um, if it's becoming more efficient, right, then it should be like more accessible, right? And, and so it should be more like of a smart investment for people if it's becoming more efficient. So I would expect it to tell me something like that, something positive about it. A kind of like contradicts that with this negative part here where it says though the high initial cost is still prohibitive to many i feel like that goes in the opposite direction suddenly at the end and i don't know that that would be a good choice um if it i what i would want to do is like i would say the first part is definitely true but then i would want to test the second part like can i see anything about the initial cost or it being really expensive and I might take a quick look in here and I don't see anything about that. So I'm going to probably say, mm, I don't know. B and C is what most of you are saying. So let's take a look at these. Have provided an opportunity to power entire planets with renewable energy. All right. I have a problem with this answer. And, and it, it's right here. What do you think might be the problem with that answer? It didn't mention the efficiency and it's, the entire planet is something very big. Okay, good. I think the first thing is very true. It doesn't quite touch on that, you know, efficiency so much. And I could maybe, I could make the argument that it doesn't have to because it references these advancements, right? But your second point is what I think is really important to note here. So good answer. Entire planets like we want to be we want to avoid grandiose answers. We want to avoid like really extreme answers because generally that's going too far. Like the world is more gray, right? It's not so black and white. So usually those aren't going to be the right answers. And even just looking at what it said in the last sentence, 22 percent compared to only 15 percent. I mean, Hey, that's great improvement in just a few years, but I don't know if that's enough to start suddenly powering planets. Like that seems a little extreme to me right now. Like let's not get too excited about this technology. I feel like that one goes too far. And and so anytime you see answers that say all, none, every, like anytime you see answers that seem too extreme, either positive or negative, you probably want to avoid them because most of the time people don't make statements like that. They're not going to make such grand statements. They're going to be a little more cautious with their statements. And so I would be hesitant to mark something that says power entire planets, you know, unless the tone of this was like super excited about the future of solar and like talking about ideas that people have had that are like really ambitious. And even if it says, Hey, this won't be possible for like another 50 years, but someday, okay, then it would maybe make sense to have something really strong like that. But the way I see it, I don't think that answer's too good here because of that issue. So looking at C, I think this is the right choice because, okay, made it possible for homeowners and business alike to enjoy greater cost savings. That makes sense. And there was something about savings in here if I kept reading a little more. But again, I understand that from the efficiency thing. Like that's clear. Um, taking advantage of renewable resources. Okay, so people can save money, take advantage of renewables. It's becoming a little more accessible, more possible for average people, right, to save some money and use this energy source. I think C is a good answer, and it is. All right, so that's what we want. Okay, so some that's some things to keep in mind when you're when you're evaluating your options. Be careful with ones that maybe go a little too far for you know your your choices um same kind of thing that i applied here when i looked at this one about alzheimer's like c says none of the experiment like right away when i see none i'm already like eh, i don't like this answer because it's it's just too extreme it's like okay you just got done telling me about these like new things that maybe could work and then you're gonna say none of them work like 
This, it, why'd you go all negative all of a sudden, you know? So I, that's what I want to be careful about, right? Something that is like too extreme. Um, and I even think going back to like the first one with the fusion stuff, I mean, the third one had this, you know, moderate way of expressing it, it has the potential to provide it virtually inexhaustible. So not saying infinite energy, you know, it, it, it's a, it's in the, it's on positive, but it's not ridiculous. Right. Um, whereas some of these go a little, I think further far reaching and revolutionary or, you know, entire cities and towns. And, and that might be true, but you know, this, this was a more moderate, well thought out response. So that's something to keep in mind when you, when you have these sentence completions. All right. So I'm going to leave that uh, other one up that w we can uh, do that seventh set for homework. That's a harder set. And I would like you to take your time on that. Just try to, you know, make sure you're following the process. Again, think about how we want to look at our question, identify the type of question, read just what we need. Really practice doing that. Try to practice reading just what you need, because I think that's the most important skill for a lot of these types of questions. That doesn't apply so much when we get into literature. And I want to talk a little bit about how we're going to approach the literature questions because I wanted to do a little bit of that with you today too before we uh, run out of time today. So I am going to send a set of literature questions over to you. And we're going to check these out together. Um, there are a few different ways that literature questions can be presented. And so I think it's important that we talk about that just for a minute here. Um, from what I have seen on the test, you're not going to get a lot of literature questions. You're getting less than the old SAT. The old SAT used to have one long reading from literature, no matter what, with about 10 or 11 questions. So it's easier now in this sense that the literature questions are like less frequent. Um, but one of the problems with them is that the SAT, from what I can tell, considers these easy questions. And I think for international students, they are not. Uh, so <laughs> that's kind of a problem. Like on the SAT, if you miss easy questions, you lose more points from what I can tell. I'm actually working on a video about that right now. Um, and the literature questions are kind of considered easier because most American students study all of the literature that they would see on the SAT. So like they will probably have read this stuff before. Some of you might, if your schools have a lot of focus on American literature or English literature, like, great. You know, you might be more comfortable with this topic. But if you're like the many people who don't have that luxury, like, you know, who've just learned uh, English secondarily, you know, just focusing on English skills and not really looking at literature, this could be harder for you. Um, there's a few different ways that these questions are presented. And most of the time I find that they're asking the main idea of the passage. And that typically goes with poetry. There are also some questions where they're asking you to sort of take lines of poetry and put them in to complete an idea. And so we'll, we're going to see a couple different types of those as we practice in our class. Uh, but generally speaking, you can break down literature into these three things and you'll see these questions come up like they might ask you a factual question about a character. If they give you a, an excerpt from a short story, they'll probably ask you something about a character. Like, what can we say about this character? And so you'll have to focus on what that character says or does in the text. If it's the main idea, that's usually a poetry question. So they're giving you an excerpt from a poem and they're asking you for the main idea or the message of the poem. I've seen a couple of questions focusing on the mood or the setting. And in that case, they might be asking you to pick lines from the, the poem to put in there. So they'll say like, oh, you know, okay, this, this literary critic has pointed out that this poem evokes a very sad mood. Which of the lines best support that analysis? And then you would say, oh, which lines look really sad? And then you put them in. So there's a few different ways these questions can be presented. It's either gonna be a quick excerpt from a book or a short story, or it's going to be a poem, okay? So we're going to see a little bit of both in these examples, all right? Um, something I always tell people to do just in terms of strategies, again, stick to our plan, look at our question first and really understand what the question is asking before you just jump into the literature. If you get the main idea, really try to put the poem into your own words. Paraphrase the poem. Like, there's a lot of words in poetry you're not going to understand, 
it took me a long time to get good at poetry. I'm not going to lie. Like, um, <laughs> it's funny because, like, uh, when I taught poetry and other literature at an Italian school here, like, my first year was rough. I'm not going to lie. I hadn't seen these things in a long time. It, it took me some time to get good at it. Uh, so it, don't focus on the words you don't understand. Try to focus on what you do understand because sometimes that's all you need. You don't need to understand every single word. Um, when, you're, when you're asked about a character, focus on dialogue, adjectives, actions. That's the three things. If you see what they're saying, see how they're described by the narrator and see what they do you will be able to answer those questions quickly. If they're looking at the setting or the mood, again, descriptions and adjectives, like which lines best give you that information, right? It's, so just try to focus on what the question is asking for. I think that's the most important thing when you deal with these questions, okay? So let's take a look at that set that I sent you and look at a few of these together. So I got a couple of, uh, the first two are poetry things and then the last ones are a little more like short story things here. So the first one, again, I don't know how many people studied Shakespeare, but like if you have, you might be familiar with this passage, but if not, it's okay, we can still figure it out. Like they're asking us what is true of Romeo. So we're just gonna try to focus on him and what he's saying and what he wants, right? And and if, you, if you're familiar with this, okay, she's saying what's in a name and uses the, the famous metaphor, that which we call a rose by any other name as well. See, so Romeo would if he weren't Romeo, right? So he's saying about getting rid of his name for that name, take all myself, like his, she's saying your name doesn't matter. And he's saying, yeah, I, I would get rid of my name, right? And she says, I will stop being Juliet. And he says, yeah, okay, cool. Say you love me and I'll never be Romeo. Like, I, I'm willing to change my name, dude. Like, but obviously he's saying that kind of metaphorically, right? So if you just understand that, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm trying to put it in my own words, you know, try to understand it my way. Like, okay, he's, he's literally, she's saying that her name is meaningless. And he's saying, yeah, yeah, that would be the thing. If I get rid of my name, then... You, then we, you just tell me that you love me and I will stop being me. <laughs> so looking at your answer choices, what would you say is the right answer? Uh, you didn't share your screen. Oh, sorry. I, I do that at least once a week. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. So it's my, my weekly forget to share screen. Made it almost to the end. So yeah, again, just looking at what I'm seeing here, Juliet's starting out by questioning the idea of a name being important, and then Romeo kind of saying, from what I can get here, that he's talking about, like, you know, get rid of that name. Um, if he weren't Romeo, he would still be Romeo. Okay, cool. And she's saying, okay, call me love, and I will never be Juliet. And he says, call me love, and I will never be Romeo. So like, just based on that, just looking at what I can understand. I'm not really trying to understand some of the complicated language. I'm trying to kind of skip over things that I don't get. Which choice would you choose? C, maybe. I think that could be a good choice. Yeah, yeah we agree. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's essentially, again, by paraphrasing it, I make it easier to understand. And, and I'm just like, honestly, this part here is a little confusing. Like I could take the time to sit here and really analyze word by word and tell you exactly what each word means here, but that's kind of a waste of our time. <laughs> like I understand just, she's asking this question and he's saying that would be true of me too. So Romeo would, so would Romeo. Sometimes moving the words around when you get like poetic stuff is good too, because the, the way it's written is in this weird way that doesn't really follow normal English conventions. I never will be like, you would say, I will never be Romeo, right? So I'm automatically correcting that as I read it and just sort of saying it more normally. And it makes it easier for me to follow. 
I, I've always found that that works really well for me. Um, so by just focusing on this stuff that I understand, like, okay, the name's not important. I won't be me and you won't be you. So the idea is renounce your identity, right? That makes sense. Like I'm willing to change my name to be with you because clearly the name is the problem with the families. And, and again, if you know more about the text, if you know, if you've studied this, that's easier, right? But like, if you don't, you kind of have to read between the lines. Um, this is another example of this. This is another Shakespearean poem. This is a sonnet. Now they're asking just for the main idea of the whole passage, right? So again, I want to try to like paraphrase this or put this in my own words. And this first line is pretty easy to understand. Shall I compare you to a summer's day, right? So, okay, we're making a comparison between a person and a summer's day. And, and so he's going to continue to make comparisons, right? You are more lovely and more temperate. Okay, so you're not as hot or oppressive, right? Um, something about wind, I don't know what that is. Okay, summer's lease is too short. I'm not sure why he's talking about that. Sometimes too hot. Okay, so sometimes like summer's not, I guess he's saying it's not the perfect comparison because like sometimes the summer's too hot or too short. Uh, okay, some stuff, I again, more stuff I don't understand. Um, okay. But, and I stop here because we can also use these little connecting words to really help us like figure out what matters. So, and, 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 like he's giving more comparisons to the summer's day, but I don't need them all. I don't really need to like get into all of them, you know, like I don't, I could sit here and try to understand all this, but it's probably not necessary. I'm just saying, oh, it's like too short, too hot, like. Okay, so it's, this guy's not exactly like a summer's day. Um, but then he says this, your eternal summer will not fade. Okay. Um, and nor shall death brag about you, internal lines. So I'm seeing this word eternal a lot. Like there's something about, okay, summer's too short, but this is eternal. And so long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, this gives life to you. Like, all right, so there's some idea here about this person lasting for longer. Like they're eternal, but summer's short. That's the, the difference that he sees. Um, so which answer kind of touches on that idea? Maybe also C. Could be C. Do you think he's focusing on the summer season or the person that he's comparing to summer? I'll go with uh, the person. A. Yeah, I, I think it would be the person just because of the nature of poetry, right? Like, usually it's romantic. It's thinking about somebody. So I, I feel like I wouldn't maybe go with C. I heard an A. Any other ideas here? Who said A? I heard somebody say it. I said A because it, it was saying about eternal and there was something about beauty or yeah. something like that. I'm with you on that, actually. And this is one of those cases where, again, like if you know some of this old language, like fair used to mean beautiful. So I know that, but like... You know, again, I, I got this eternal vibe in this comparison to summer. So I think this is the right answer. Like the idea that you will retain your beauty for all time. Summer's too short, you know, but you won't fade. Your summer, your beautiful summer, right? Like, and he did say you're more lovely than summer. So yeah, like there's little pieces in here that I can understand and sort of stick together in order to say A should probably be the best answer. And, and I, yeah, we're good. That's basically it. So that that's sort of my approach to poetry. It's a little messy. I won't lie. I don't think there's a simple rule for handling poetic text. I think the best thing to do is this, though. Just try to focus on what you can understand. Like, I'm genuinely not trying to understand all these things because I see that he's just giving, like, more of the same idea. But when I see that but, I go, oh, okay, there's something, like, unique here. There's some. There's a change here in the poem and so i might want to pay more attention here and then seeing this you know will not fade okay i understand that you know uh i get a little confused here but again i see this eternal a couple times i can put it together right
that's that's what I usually recommend when you get these poetic texts. If you can't understand all the words, especially if you get something like Shakespeare, um, some poems are easier to follow because they're more modern. If you get something like this, this is your best approach. Like try to just simplify, focus on what you can understand, and you'll probably get that main idea without having to work too hard. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of our time, but let's let's just try to finish this one up, and then I'll leave you one more for homework. We only got three more questions here. Um, try to, now, look, this is just straight up prose. This is not poetry, right? True, the female character in the passage. So I just want to focus on the things that she does and any descriptions of her. So there's all this stuff about a man on the bench. None of this matters. Okay. She nodded mutely. All right. She swallowed, unsure of what kind of answer she wanted. And then the guy continues to explain stuff, and I don't think anything matters. And then she felt lighter. Is there a great way to be lifted? So this is what I want to focus on. Like, these are some things about her that I can look at. So she is there in front of this man. He says, you have a question. Like, he has to force her to ask this question. She nodded mutely. She didn't actually say, yes, I have a question. And then she still wasn't quite sure, like, how to get the question out there. And then she asked this question, this, like, deep, profound question. Okay. Pretty simple here, I think. Based on that evidence, what can we say is true? I'll go with uh, C. Think and C. Because she was like a little bit anxious, timid a little. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that was smart, right? Like these two things. Again, I look at actions. Actions speak louder than words when it comes to literature. So I look at actions. I see not saying she doesn't have confidence in what she's saying, right? Like there's clearly she's a little bit hesitant for some reason. And and this even being unsure of her answer like that gives me a timid vibe. Somebody who like can't bring themselves to interrupt somebody, can't like just ask her question. She's not coming in all bold and confident like the A answer would suggest. Unsure of her desires could maybe be, but like at the same time she seems to have a question that like she knows she wants to ask this person this question. Like that desire is clear. She's just struggling to do it. So that implies more that she's timid than anything else. That would be my answer too. So yeah, I think that's a good choice. Um, okay, my sheet is not broken. Same thing here. We got a character passage. We're talking about Charles Austin. I just want to focus on on him. Now in this case, there's a lot of stuff about him. You know, I'm, I'm noticing both these paragraphs are about him. So I'm going to want to focus on him. Go ahead and uh, try to give me your answer for this one. All right, I think I've got my answer now that I've highlighted some stuff just to illustrate what I'm looking at. Any ideas here? Could be C. Warm disposition. What's the uh, evidence that makes you think that? 
when he remembered his wife, he became sad, and that changed his mood. Okay, changed his mood. I usually, when I see warm disposition, I tend to think about someone who's kind of like caring and open to other people. So this is what I would looked at, right? Like when I was going through these, um, I, I at first thought like I wanted to go through and eliminate, um, overcome by grief. I didn't get that impression. He seems like he's pretty calm and stable. Like he doesn't seem like someone who's unable to function because of grief, uh, changes jobs frequently does not connect with the past 20 years. worth. So that's clearly wrong. Um, and, and so I was looking between kind of A and C because it seemed like on one hand I was like, oh, I mean, he's pushing away the memories, right? And focusing on helping these people like that could support this. But then I also look at this and it's like, all right, he has a portrait of his wife on the wall. Like if you're trying to suppress the past, you probably don't do that. You wouldn't have that picture up because then you would see that all the time and it would remind you of like something bad that happened in the past. So that made me think no. And then I think there's a lot of evidence for warm disposition. So I do agree that that's the right answer. Like all this stuff, the people love him. He's helped them through good times and bad times. He's always there for like advice and listens to people. Um, and he, he finishes up by focusing on helping people. Like that's what a person with the warm disposition does. Um, yeah, he's got some bad things in the past, but he's not trying to hide them. He's like putting them right there in his face. It makes him sad, but he still lives with it. So, yeah, C would be my best answer. Let's look at the last one here. Then we'll, then we'll wrap it up. We're looking about the villagers of Zarso. I might use these words to help me look specifically at things in the text. To be perfectly clear, I, I normally would not like recommend that you spend time highlighting stuff uh, with the highlighting tool in Blue Book. That is a thing you can do. I do not recommend it though, um, because in my opinion, it's just <laughs> it's it's more likely to give you problems than anything else. Um, I, I wouldn't suggest doing that. So. It, it takes too long to do it in the app, in my experience, and you need to move faster than that. But I am doing it here for illustrative purposes, just to kind of show you what I'm looking at so that you can see what my eyes are focusing on. I wouldn't do this in real life, like on a real test. But um, what I, I wanted to focus on the villagers, right? And I'm focusing on what they did. Sense of dread might be the last day of their life. They knew a raid was coming. Okay, so they're very aware of all the problems and things that could happen here. And so I think that C is definitely wrong. Uh, willing to fight. They hid in their homes. Like, they, they don't seem like they're getting ready for battle. So I don't, I'm not liking that answer. And I'm, I'm with you, Mohammed. I, I ended up eliminating the other three just to get to my answer D. Uh, prepared to turn each other in also doesn't seem accurate. Because, again, they're staying together, like, trying to keep each other safe. So they, they weren't just going to, like tell on each other right so like there's evidence to disprove b and c directly and there's no evidence for a 
solace in being together. Yeah, I mean, they're they're like this could be their last day of their lives. They're and they're spending it together. Like, okay, that seems like the right answer to me. Yeah. All right. So those are some, you know, examples of these literary questions and what you can do with them. Again, I think when it comes to regular prose, it's not that difficult. When it gets into poetry is where it gets tricky. Uh, like I said, try to simplify. Try to just focus on what you do understand and, and look at the connecting words and things to try to help guide you. Don't get too caught up in the stuff you don't understand. Because if you do, you're going to sit there and stare at it forever. And we don't have time for that. All right. So that's all for today. Any questions? I know we're running a little over, but whatever. I'm not busy. Yeah, so like in this example, should I read the whole article or the whole text? So I think in the case of these literary questions, you may need to read more than you normally do. Um, as I've said with some of the other cases, like when we looked at these sentence completion examples, um, I read what I need. Like right here, this is all I needed for this question, right? Just these first two sentences or just these two in the middle, just these two at the end. Like for certain kinds of questions, I'm going to read just certain parts. And so that's part of why I'm trying to show everybody these strategies for what to do with each kind of question. So when I see sentence completion, I need to go, okay, what kind of question do I have? Most logically completes the text. Okay, I'm dealing with a sentence completion. I need to look at the blank. I need to read the sentence before and the sentence after. That's my mental process. That's the that's the strategy. Yeah, and so, that's with that's completion. Yeah. Yeah. So then when I get to literature, right, it gets it gets a little more complicated, I'll be honest. Um, if I've got something that's kind of poetic, I'm gonna have to go through the whole thing, but I'm gonna just kind of skim through. When I see stuff I don't understand, I'm skipping it. I'm I'm like I, I literally just stopped reading all this. <laughs> like I didn't read any of this <laughs> because it was like, all right, this is confusing, but I can tell because it keeps saying and, and, and like I can use some of the information to sort of tell me, okay, I don't need this. So I do have to go through it, I think, but I'm going to go through and be selective. I'm going to focus on what I do understand and try to ignore some of the noise, some of the other stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And and Thank so when I, when I'm, yeah, no, you're welcome. I, I appreciate you asking. Like for me, I'm, I'm able to kind of see these few words that kind of give me the idea that I need. And I, and that's enough for me to answer the question. You know, again, I've taught this exact poem. I could sit here and spend 15 minutes with you guys and break down line by line, but like, that's not helpful. We need to learn how to do this in a minute, you know? So that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, with this stuff, if I get a question about a character, I can be specific. I can scan for things about her. I, I saw that all this was about a man. I don't need it. Like, I don't need to read this. Once I see, I'm just seeing all this. He, all right. You know, okay. She saw, but she saw him. She saw the guy. So it's, it doesn't matter about that, you know? So I just, and, and then I know his reply doesn't even matter really because all I'm focusing on is her. So, I don't know where that information is going to be because there's no blank on literature questions. So I have to figure it out. I have to be able to go through this text and sort of separate the good stuff that I need from the extra information that I don't. This last one, I think, was a, or this fourth one's a little trickier because there are details throughout the whole thing. So maybe here I'm going to go, eh, crap, I got to read the whole thing here. <laughs> like maybe this one I do. Because in order for me to kind of get this warm disposition idea, I did have to go through here, you know, and I, I did read through the whole thing. Um, with this one, I could tell this is a lot of context at the beginning. I don't need a lot of that context. Um, but I do see that, you know, this, this paragraph focused on the people of Zarsa. So I could probably focus more here. And once it gets to the Nazis, I stopped reading. Because I'm like, okay, we're talking about the Nazis now. I'm worried about these people. This is what they asked me to look at. So as much as I can, I'm always looking to just minimize the amount of information I have to take in. If I can just focus on a certain part of the text where I think the answer will be, I'm probably going to save a lot of time. And I'm also going to minimize distractions. And that's going to make me more efficient. 
Any other questions? All right, cool. If not, then that's all I got for you today. Um, I'm going to send another pack of literature questions for you for homework. And you can do that set seven of sentence completion, which is like harder ones. And we'll check those out when we come back next week. See you. Thank you so much. All right. You're welcome so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you guys.